He was talking about the wall one time. And he goes, this wall is so tall, it's impenetrable. It's impenetrable. You cannot get over this wall unless you have a really tall ladder. And I just thought, like, <laughs> he just did himself in, but he does it in such a great comedic way. Like, <laughs> yeah, right. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Travis Makes Friends. Today, I'm making friends with John DiDomenico. He is a local here in Las Vegas, a stand-up comic, the number one Trump impersonator in the world. He's been featured on Conan O'Brien and Howard Stern and basically anything else where people like to impersonate Trump. So, uh, John, what's up, man? Welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me back. Was I on before? Or was, uh, was I just here for the event? I think it was just the event just last the time. Event. Yeah. I feel like I've seen so much of your stuff. I feel like I've been interviewed. Well, we're we're gonna we're gonna do a lot of it today. So, uh, so we're sitting here in Proprietors Reserve right now in this really cool venue in Vegas, <clears throat> and getting ready for a dinner party, our first dinner party ever episode tonight. The round table, the meeting the of round, the minds. That's exactly right. So uh, you're coming through for that. We figured, hey, we got you out here. We're doing an interview. May as well sit down and do a one on one before we you know tackle that. So let's rewind the clock, man, uh, because. I always find the conversation fascinating when I sit down with somebody like yourself who is not in a traditional career path. Um, Because a lot of times you, when you rewind the clock back to when you're six, seven, eight, nine years old, you're probably not sitting there going like, I'm going to be the number one Trump impersonator in the world. That's what I want to be when I grow up. I knew I wanted to be an actor and a comedian. I didn't know I was going to be that. Okay. So let's start there. Let's start there. Seven, seven year old John DiDomenico. Talk to us. Actually, when I was five, I, um, I, was you know i'm 60 so i used to watch the ed sullivan show and watch all the comedians on sunday night and one of them was john biner who's a great comedian and uh he was an impressionist there were a lot of impressionist comedians back then and he would do ed sullivan and i my neighborhood in ambler pennsylvania looked like south philly it was all row homes Mm. so the adults would sit out on the steps and i would come out and i would do his act oh really now right here in our shoe and I had a really good memory and I did the voices and my neighbors loved it. And I got a lot of, you know, you know, a- a- adults clapping for you and laughing. The laughing is like the best part, That's mm. like the, the drug. And I just thought it was great. And then the other side being, I had a severe speech impediment. So when I did the impressions, there was no impediment. Mm. So by the time I got, it was six and seven and I was in first grade, they diagnosed me and then I did eight years of speech therapy, two times a week. And those speech therapists and speech pathologists were basically teaching me how to do more voices. Hmm, Not interesting. To, yeah, because they were explaining it, Yeah, inadvertently, yes, yeah, right. Throat placement, nasal placement, vocal production, where your voice is supposed to be, the vocal mask, all these things that I still use today, which makes me understandable, obviously, because they fixed my speech. But, uh, you know, if I'm doing someone like Trump, you know, that you get the nasality, you got the throat placement, you got the vocal production, <laughs> the enunciation, you know, so all these things oh, come into so play. Good. So when I do any voice, I try to do it scientifically, you know, so I can so I can nail the voice. So but growing up in that neighborhood in a row home neighborhood in Ambler, Pennsylvania, which is like a super fun site for asbestos, that's not a joke. Because um, <laughs> it was the biggest asbestos <laughs> factory in the country. This is why oh, I can't man. see or breathe properly. Uh, but uh, it was, uh, all I knew was my dad was a hardworking guy, ninth grade education, worked mm. in a steel factory, standard press steel. And I would watch TV and movies and think, there is something beyond Ample, Pennsylvania. Mm, and yeah. I have to get the hell out of here. So um, I, you know, I was always restless and ADHD and yeah. I was always doing something performing wise. I would resell things. I was like an entrepreneur and, you know, I was just one of those people. And then, in, you know, when you're in school and high school, uh, you get to do musicals and mm. plays. And, <clears throat> and if you're, you know, if you're inventive at all, you can say, Hey, can I do something? Can I put something up? And, you know, school's like, sure, you can do anything you want. That's why you've got all this stuff here. So then on to college, and uh, outside of college, I had a plan to go to New York to become an actor. I became a copywriter in Philadelphia. And I was already doing acting and doing film and TV and all those things that you do when you're starting out. And I thought this, I w- I'm going to get to New York. And I hated having a regular job. Yeah. 
hated. What what type of copy were you writing? I was I was writing copy for uh, businesses in the Philadelphia area. So all adver- ad like advertising copy. Advertising copy. Okay. Yeah, I writing <clears throat> advertising copy, and the way I got the job was instead of doing a regular resume, I wrote my resume in crayon. <laughs> in blocks almost like a cartoon and i sent that out as double-sided and that's that's what got me the interviews no way. That's it funny. Was, you know something different because i'm always like how can you do something differently how can you approach something that's done before a little differently and mm. they got a big kick out of that so, yeah yeah so but the whole copywriting thing didn't work out and around that time i joined a um, sketch comedy group and i and i was working on stand-up and i was pr- pursuing an acting career and uh, life never, nothing's what you think it is mm. until you're in it. And then you realize like, oh, this is, this is very inefficient and this isn't the way I like to work. And I, you know, I really wanted to be a stand up comedian and I, I was working it and it was like 95, 96, 97. I was just all over the place and, you know, out late at night. Is this how you were making money? Oh, okay. very little money. Yeah. Very little money in that. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, I was. Um, I ended up working in Atlantic City as a performer and under Got contract it. for like okay. a year. And during that time, I was developing more characters and okay. impressions. And, th- and I was being paid for that because it was like a walk- very unusual job. They had just built um, Tropicana at the time, which was called Trop World Atlantic City. And they had an adult amusement pier. Mm. So they want a constant, continuous entertainment. Gotcha. Okay. So I got to walk around and do these impressions of Groucho Interesting. and Columbo. So kind of almost like an ideal job. Oh, for, for someone like me. It's yeah. Because you're. I love to walk up yeah. to people and I love to interact with people and get the improvisational thing yeah. happening. And it it allowed you to work on what you really wanted to work on, but actually get paid to do it. Right. Right. Yeah. But you're not like on a main stage or anything sure. like that. But one of the cool things there was they had mech the talking slot machine if you came into this saloon there was a talking slot machine and i used to sit there for hours and be the voice of it and just oh no way and i could modulate my voice up and down so it sounded mechanical so that was a great training ground Mm. and then um the play i got into a play in philadelphia and then i was back and forth to new york auditioning and then ended up up in an improv company along with the sketch thing and you know it's all those progressive steps yeah and uh but right around 96 97 i did my first big corporate job okay and in the course of one week i was at the villa east in lancaster i was a featured comedian and and i just remember walking in because you have an idea what you're like i'm gonna be a stand-up comedian and you don't realize how lonely it is Mm. But you're by yourself. You're mm-hmm. pretty much on your own. Yeah. You know, all the comedians are coming. The other two comedians are coming in from another place and, and you get there and um, it's not like McDonald's. I mean, every club is different. The sight lines are different. The staff is different. The sound is different. <laughs> and I walked in and this guy who was he's eating pasta at the bar, it's like, it's out of me. Like this. He's eating it. And I'm like, hi, how you doing? I'm John D. Domenico. I'm your featured act this week. And he's like, well, I hope you're fucking funny. <laughs> the last guy your agency sent sucked. And I was like, great to meet you too, sir. <laughs> and he put me in a broom closet. because I'm sure you've heard stories among comedians about where they put us up. It was terrible. But I did really well that week. But the following week was my first corporate job for Sony. And I was, they, they fly you down first class. Hmm. They have a guy picked me up at the airport very first time someone had my name yeah yeah on a thing you know john d domenico spelled correctly and i was like oh i could get used to this <laughs> and the guy said to me he says hey, uh, we didn't we were out of town cars do you mind it's a stretch limo i'm like do i mind <laughs> that it's a stretch yeah. limo are you kidding me <laughs> then we go to the hotel and it's the swan at disney and i'd never been to disney yeah my family was Poor. Mm-hmm. I mean, we would go to Ocean City, New Jersey, and stay on the town outside of it. We couldn't afford to stay in Ocean City. <laughs> That's how bad it was. And uh, I just remember staying there, and the show went great. I'm thinking, like, I think I'd like to do corporate. Yeah, this sounds like a much better <laughs> way. A much better yeah. deal. I'm, I'm feeling a paid. calling. Yes, on the, yeah. <laughs> so I kept. I, I kind of. Wi- I was winding down on the comedy clubs, but still performing and um, always doing voices always looking for multiple ways to get booked. 
Mm. You know, I, I, I wasn't James Dean. I didn't want to just like study acting and just wait for acting stuff. I wanted to be a comedian. I wanted to do sketch comedy. I wanted to do improv comedy. I'm very restless. Mm. And all those things were happening and I was meeting people and some really cool things were happening, but it's a, you know, I'm like a journeyman actor. Uh, and you know, I lucked out with Austin powers because of Mike Myers, but that's not my character, mm. you know? And, uh, but I started doing Trump in 2004 because I had met him in 1990. I did a show at the Plaza and I said, this guy's, this guy's really interesting. Yeah. And then I co hosted his 55th birthday as Austin Powers, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then I, the first season of The Apprentice came out and I was like, oh, this is, this is a great show. And I was, and I'd always been thinking about the voice. Um, because when I was moving to New York in 86, 87, I was trying to get like a feel for New York city. I knew the history of the city. Okay. Like who's the, who are the pop culture? Sure. Yeah, it yeah. was him all the time. He was in the paper constantly. And, uh, when the apprentice was on, I was going to really hear his voice other than like a news clip. Sure. And I started like, well, oh, this, this is interesting because he's, he's from Queens, but it doesn't sound like he's from Queens and he, he's very verbose. And, and I just thought, oh, and I, yeah, let me, let me work on this. And around the, that time, I got a call from one of my New York agents and said, Hey, are you doing Trump yet? And I said, no, not yet. <laughs> Should I? And they said, yeah, we have an audition for you on Monday. Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, okay. So I literally ran out and bought the DVD of the first season of The Apprentice, which had just come out. Just come out. And I auditioned. And bought, I the DVD bought the DVD. Bought the DVD. It was 30 season. hours. It was yeah. amazing. This box set, which is like a treasure trove of material. Because, and it wasn't the stuff that was necessarily on TV. It was the, the bonus material. It's like when you listen to him on Howard Stern, there's, a, there's multiple Trumps. Sure. This was so helpful. I went in, auditioned, and I got it. And I later found out it was for him. Oh, really? Yeah. It was for the boardroom game at the Taj Mahal. And they needed to, someone to record hundreds of phrases, words. No way. Stuff. Yeah. Wow. So if you were in Atlantic City and you went to the Taj Mahal, he had this boardroom game and they had two live people. One was George Ross uh, and Carolyn Capture, which were the first season of The Apprentice. And then they were saying, oh, Mr. Trump will be here momentarily. And then the phone rings, and it's me as Trump. Hello, everybody. I'm so sorry. I'm in the middle of a very, very big deal, but you got great people. You got George and Carolyn. I'm going to listen in. I'm going to listen in. Blue team, green team. And they just would plug in all of this stuff. And it was my first, first experience That's working wild. for him. And it was, it was great. What, and, what year was this? This was 2004. Okay. This would have been 2004. And uh, the only direction I ever received, I went to a studio in Princeton, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. They were, it was an ISD online. I could plainly hear the executives and they would say, be meaner, be meaner. <laughs> Literally the only direction I ever got, be meaner, be meaner. Like, okay. That's a pretty good deal. Yeah. Uh, so I did that. And then two years later, Trump had was the apprentice is now in its second or third season. And yeah. there was a cross promotion between the apprentice, the apprentice, number one rated show ever, uh, the apprentice and embassy suites where they redesigned their uniforms. Mm. And Trump was supposed to be on to promote that episode that night. And he was unavailable. So I get a call like the day before. And they can you be in New York? I was, yeah, I live right outside of the city. And they said, you're going to be on Fox news. This is a really big segment. We're promoting, for the show. And I ended up that set. I was supposed to be on for a quick thing where I pull up in a limousine, get out of the car as Trump walk into Fox news. And they have a chef with me because all month long at the embassy suites and in honor of this, they were serving the domlet instead of an omelet. You could order the domlet. And so I walk in with the chef behind me and look it up. The photos are still Getty images. I walk in, I'm supposed to do one segment. They kept me on for like three. Wow. Cause I was just improving in character and having yeah. a blast. And I watched these poor news anchors <laughs> eat ice, an ice cold omelet that had easily been made three, four hours before. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Oh, it's Delicious. so good. It's so full of cheese and ham, <laughs> just like me, you know, <laughs> So that, you know, so that kind of started it and I kept doing it. And, and, you know, with, with me, I always like to expand things and I kept reselling the character and doing after D 
dinner speeches for corporate. Yeah. I'd come in and roast all the executives. I would. I did a boardroom. I, boardroom now he's got me saying. Uh, <laughs> I did an apprentice game where it was 150 people. I could made it scalable because huh. anytime I take anything on, I want to kind of. I want to maximize it. Sure. I'm going to take yeah. the time to spend the money on the clothes and the wigs and all that kind of stuff. I want to take it to the the the, the fullest potential that I can. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And that's the, and that part of that is like growing up an ambler and trying not to be poor. <laughs> yeah, right. Right, exactly. Well, <clears throat> you f- I find it it's it's very common with a lot of the people that I interview right. is most of the people that I've interviewed did not come from money and they come from a similar type of a background and I, th- I think that's one of the reasons that you and them are successful now because you know what it's like oh. to be there and you're like I don't I don't want to live like that for the rest of my life. Yeah. So how do I avoid check that at all costs? Is, is a horrible, horrible thing. And not having control of your life and control, the of control, your, you know, it's freedom. A, trading time for money. Right. And that's, that was never satisfying to me. And my dad, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't like the smartest guy, uh, but he, every now and then he would say something really, it was like a, like a nugget. He, when I was a kid, he was a guy who was a world war two veteran worked in a steel plant, but he said, you'll never get rich working for somebody else. And I know that mm. many people have said that, but like for him to even say that yeah, was right. just like very unusual. And <clears throat> he worked on the weekends. He cut grass. The guy works seven days a week. Yeah. You know, it's almost a recognition of his own fate. Right. To, to constantly have to work constantly for somebody else. Work. And yeah. he was a smart guy and it was interesting. He would in the garage in our tiny little house, he had a little, little table set up, but he used to make uh, jewelry sometimes. Mm. And I was just like, where's this coming from? Like he would take mother of pearl and he would Very clean it and make them. I was like, who's this guy? Yeah. But I think there was a lot of art. There was an artistic element in him, but he couldn't even let it out. Sure. Uh, just because he'd have the time. We're talking about a different generation. Totally different went generation. Went and fought in world war two, yeah. born in the twenties, lived through the depression, yeah. Yeah. you know, like that's a different, different uh, mindset. Th- those were men. Yeah. <laughs> you know what Here, I mean? Yeah. <laughs> He was they a were man. men. Let me tell you, it's a totally different world. Yeah. So he, he, you know, <clears throat> one of the things people are like, my friends say, you're the hardest working man in show business. And obviously people watching are like, who the hell are you? But I, I do like to work. Yeah. And I did get that from him because the only way you can succeed is hard work. Smart, obviously. You know, you want to work Smart, smarter work. than harder. Correct. Correct. But, you know, uh, he worked because he had to. I work because I love it. Yeah. You know, I like having multiple projects happening. I like being able to travel. I like going around the world and offering something that no one else offers. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, and I did the stand-up route. It, that wasn't, it didn't work for me. I'm it, The time on the road was incredibly valuable. Mm. Learned to be a much better writer. But it's better suited for what I want to accomplish in, in front of our, you know, corporate audience. Not that I don't, you know, I get itchy and I'll do shows here. Mm. You know, shows at Notoriety and the space. And yeah. I, I have to get on stage. And I have a standing invitation from Harry Basil at um, the uh, Laugh Factory. Like, Anytime you want to come in, I'm like, I should take him up on that. <laughs> <laughs> at some point. Yeah, <laughs> at yeah. some point. Um, what about your mom? What did your mom do? My mom, you know, my mom was a typical 50s housewife. Okay. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the unusual thing about these two people were is they hated each other. <laughs> um, my, my mother had gotten divorced and got her two kids from that marriage. My father had gotten divorced. This is the late 50s, like 59, 60. Mm-hmm. And um, they, they met and had a wonderful evening. And I'm the product of that evening. <laughs> and they married each other because that's what you did in 1962. Right. And uh, the, growing up, there was a photo of them with their wedding night in Atlantic City, which was torn in half, taped back together, torn in half, <laughs> taped back together. Because they literally fought like cats and dogs. Ah, uh, yeah. Fought all the time. You know, this is, um, it's, you're one of your other guests talked about the marriage thing and mm-hmm. choosing somebody. And I'm also a big proponent of, of that. And I say that as a person who has been divorced twice. <laughs> I, will, I am not, I'm not so smart. I'm learning as I go. Uh, but I, I, I think what people should be teaching, like the things they should be teaching in school is how to pick a friend, totally, how right. to pick a playmate, <clears throat> how to pick a, 
spouse like right. these things they don't it's all like a card game you walk in on like everyone's playing cards i'd like to play cards i don't really know how to play cards totally play cards and then you you know they teach you the least important things and the that are the most important, important things, things. <laughs> and then you're in college you know you you know you have a girlfriend in college you maybe have a girlfriend um you know post college maybe it's the same person but then your friends are getting married it's like i guess i should get married too everyone sure, else right, is getting married right. and everyone's marching kind of in lockstep that's what people say i should do next right. yeah instead of like i really want to do this you know yeah <laughs> so. um so, so you you mentioned did you have siblings that you grew up with yes. or okay was I, that i i had i had three siblings from my fir- half siblings uh, three sisters from my father's first marriage. Okay. And then my brother, George, and sister, Carol, from my uh, mom's uh, marriage. And I grew up with George and Carol, and then my biological, 100% biological brothers, Michael and Stephen, who were fraternal twins. Wow. So this is like eight total children. Not in the same house. So we had a three-bedroom house with um, uh, four boys, Okay. one girl, two adults and it was, it was jam packed. No one kidding. bathroom. Yeah. No kidding. One bathroom, one bathroom. three bedroom, one yeah. bathroom. So talk about wanting to get out of a place. No like, kidding. I yeah. was so ready to get out of there. Did any of your siblings have that same desire or. Yeah. Michael, Steven, we're all my blood brother, my, Michael D. Domenico, Steven D. Domenico. We're all similar in the sense that we're, we all tested very well. We're intelligent people. Um, and we've all done well in our chosen fields mm-hmm. uh, because we want to, we yeah. want to succeed. Sure. And so that was, that was great. Cause I just knew, I, I, I think it was odd because I think my father's inability to grow out of where he was to escape, to escape it. Because there were so many times he may have had opportunities to do something. He couldn't. He just didn't have the money. He couldn't, yeah. he couldn't see beyond that. We all have done like <laughs> bigger things and um, uh, kind of succeeded and exceeded a lot of expectations from you know, where we're from. Sure. What we, what we, you know, we saw, we grew up with people that are, like, that are dead. Right. Because you know? right. yeah. <laughs> it was a tough town. And there was a lot of, you know, set all through the 70s and 80s, there was a lot of I don't want to use temptations, but a lot of things to divert you. Sure, yeah. And a lot of people got into that. I mean, even my my brother George died of alcoholism. Yeah. So, and that was, and he had incredible potential. He went to LaSalle, and he was a very intelligent guy, and very charming, and yeah. he just couldn't, he just couldn't beat it. Yeah, you know? yeah. And I feel, one of the things I feel really strongly about is, like, I think we all have, and I can only speak to myself, I have a moral imperative to meet my fullest potential. Mm. That's like, this is why I'm here. Yeah. You know, I don't care about going to a party or doing this. Or do, I, I, there's a lot of things I want to do and a lot of things I have done, but you know, I'm in this <laughs> world and you're in this world of meeting some really peak performers. And I'm like, I want to do that. I want to get to the, I want to max out as a human being. Yeah. Learn as much as I can, do as much as I can, and hopefully all these experiences kind of give back to somebody, mm. you know, mentor somebody just in a way so they too can be further along the path than me at my age. Well, it's so cliche, but we do only get the one the one shot at it. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Life is not a rehearsal. <clears throat> yeah. And I believe me, I've wasted a lot of time. <laughs> I'm fully aware I've wasted a lot of time. Yeah. So I'm, I'm coming to the point where I spend more to any downtime I have. I'm listening to a book um, on audible or I'm watching, um, you know, something on YouTube. Yeah. There's so many things that, that, you know, at this moment in history, I used to say this to my brother. I said, at this moment in history, there's no excuse that you're an alcoholic. Hmm. Everything's out there. Every book, there's videos, there's AA meetings online, there's AA meetings on the phone, there's web AA meetings. But then con- conversely, there's no reason at this time in history that you can't succeed, no matter who you are. Hmm. Everything is out there. Like, like this, yeah. this, this, this library of Congress of ways to succeed, ways to take your talents and make a living out of them. YouTube, TikTok, all of these yeah. things. You know, it's almost inexcusable. And it's all free. Yeah, it's all free. Yeah. Platforms that'll put you up. I mean, there were, there were, you know, barriers to 
all of this not that long ago. Right. You could right. not get to the public. Right. With whatever your talent was, singing, dancing, you know, comedy, comedy, yeah. turning a coin into a, you know, a death star, <laughs> yeah, you know what right. I mean? Whatever it is. And so I, I, I encourage people like to leverage these things. These things are free, whatever your talent is. Yeah. You know? And, and probably things that you wish you could have had yes. when you oh. were working through and grinding through the like, Oh, we got to go to this show and I'm on tour over here, but and I got to get to this other studio. Like everything had to be done in person and you had to travel everywhere in order to be able to get a small fragment of the population to see the talent that you were constantly cultivating. Right. Whereas now you can have full distribution to the entire world on YouTube or right. TikTok it's, or podcast. You know, it's you know, I actually was talking to somebody today. He's an 18 year old kid. Really nice. Uh, he's my, I was getting some physical therapy today yeah. and I was talking to him <clears throat> and I, you know, to say to him, you know, I had a show and the only way I could reach people for that show was to literally find out their address, keep a mailing list, physically put something together, put it in the mail so they could get it and they could conceivably make the decision to come see my show. Mm. I mean, like that was the only way to communicate with people to yeah. have their phone number. Right. But you know, phone, you know, calling people was time consuming. So to be able to have access to all of this stuff, right? Meet so many people, it's it's really incredible. The click of a button on your computer. Yeah. Yeah. To yeah. <laughs> go back to that living life to the fullest thing, I, I heard this quote one time that that always kind of stuck with me, and it was like, it said, and I'm probably going to but butcher it here. Um, we'll try to grab the full thing and put it in the show notes or somewhere, but. Um, it was basically said something along the lines of live this life as though you have already lived a life as recklessly as you're about to live this one or something like that. I know and, that quote. Yeah. And it all, it's in one of my books. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Like when I did like keep, when I hear stuff like that, I write it down. <laughs> that one always, that one always stuck with me because it, it's kind of like that you, you, you're tempted to have, kind of live this version of hedonism or, right. or where you just like, Hey, I only get one shot at this. Let me just you know, seek pleasure and have fun and do right. all. It's just like, no, no, no. Pretend like you've already lived a life where you did all of that shit. Right. Like you already fucked your life in this other life. Pretend that that already happened. Right. Now come to this life and live this life as though you've already done that. <clears throat> and that one always stuck with me. And it seems like that's something that, that you have lived by. Yeah. Um, or at least, you know, tried to try yeah, keep I'm it the forefront. To, yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to, and I listen to this one thing every morning. I think it's on fearless, um, uh, one of these great uh, YouTube channels, mm -hmm. but it says, don't be concerned about missing out because everyone's like, Oh, I wanted to go to that party. Like FOMO is so bad. Totally. It's horrible. Don't be concerned about that. Be concerned. You're in the same fucking place a year from now, mm -hmm. two years from now. Don't worry about a party or an event or a con what, don't worry. Be a little more concerned about your progress yeah. in, in your career. Wake up with an intention, you know, and I'm not talking workaholism. I'm talking sure. about yeah, yeah. like, wake up with an intention. Where do you want to be? How do you want to get there? Because if you don't know where you're going, guarantee you will get there. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and even with the best intentions, it may take, there might be the, a different route, but during that route, it may change how you approach things. Right. Right. Well, you're not going to see the finish line, but you can see the next step. Right. But if you don't ever take the next step, the finish line never It'll never get there. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, no, that's it's it's kind of like, and I forget who said it. The guy who created um, um, uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul, but he always said like, "Yeah, Jack Canfield." You're driving across <clears throat> the country in a car. It's foggy, and you really can only see like eight, ten feet in front of you. Mm -hmm. You're still going to drive across the country, but you're only going to like see this much. Mm -hmm. See this mm -hmm. much. Your goal is here, but you're only going to see this much in front of you as you go. And I always thought that was very very interesting and great words to live by you know just you yeah. just have to keep grinding right right yeah. i want to get back into uh the later part of the story i, I wanted to rewind for a second talk about kind of siblings and family dynamics and stuff but uh it's fascinating that you were already doing the trump stuff before trump became trump right. really i mean like obviously he was always well known yeah, but he was a more regional, sane version of being well known. <laughs> yeah, you sure. I mean? In New York was yeah, obviously, yeah. you know, where he was most influential probably before before he was on television right. and all those things. But you were already doing it before 
he even became the caricature of himself that he eventually became anyway. Yes. Um, which, which was the greatest thing that could have happened. I was going to say for you, it yeah. was like, a, yeah. it, 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 it was almost like your career was directly tied to how ridiculous he became. You know what I mean? Like it was you like, know, it's like, if you love something, like you're in the pickleball yeah. right here before everybody else. And I'm pickleball. Right. For like, this you're like, I was there is. before. Right. Yeah. The, and I, <laughs> you know, I just found him fascinating and read books about him and just, just an interesting guy. And man, talk about right place. Yeah. Like right time. So when he, when he announced, uh, and I was very lucky because a buddy of mine, Tom Shalou, who I used to do stand up comedy with, had, just taken over Red Eye on Fox News from Greg Gutfeld. Oh, really? Okay. I mean, it was unbelievable timing. Everything was unbelievable timing, but it was like, hey, do you want to be on the show as our Trump on Fox News? And I said, sure, absolutely. And then we would, I would, if I was in New York and I used to be there all the time, I would be live in studio or we'd do it from a satellite studio here in town. And then supposedly some of Conan's writers, somebody saw me on that and then i got picked up by conan mm. and then i then chelsea handler picked me up and then uh, another show picked me up then i was picked up by shows in australia <laughs> and i was just it was just this is all around the election year like 20 the, yeah from the announcement uh in what, may june well his birthday's june so he announced like the day after his birthday or day before uh that so may june july august September, october but 2016 yeah insane blew up with work blew up. Yeah. just literally took all the photos from 2016 and finally got them got them organized mm. and foldered and i'm looking i, I was going through oh, damn that was a good year i <laughs> <laughs> was crisscrossing the country flying around the world yeah you know, right. like 12 appearances on the today show in australia and i'm like this is Right. Wow. You know, and it was, and it was all those things I talked about. It was the sketch comedy. It was the improv, obviously the practice, you know, all any yeah. kind of voice work. It takes a lot of practice. You're stacking skills over a 25 year career that led up to this kind of and culmination like, of, yeah. And that's why they love to have me on because I wasn't just, hello, I'm not a trip. How are you? It was a fully fleshed out. Hello, everybody. So I love the Australian people. Great people. <laughs> really incredible people. I want to be the king. <laughs> can I do that? Can I do that? Because you speak English. You people get vote, by the way. Mail in your votes. You know. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, a full character. Yeah, it was a not full character, and I got to develop it over time. And I knew, you know, I knew once he announced, everybody was going to be doing Trump. Oh, I right. Knew it. Right. Well, anytime somebody's in the any politician. Right, especially at the presidential level, yeah. gets mocked or impersonated every by day. everybody. Yeah, yeah. and um, and certain people popped out, and I was who, like, who, I who, who besides you do you I think? I thought Anthony Atomanik, who's basically retired from doing Trump, um, who is an actor in New York, and we had some mutual friends, but I thought he was overall the best because mm. he had a fully formed uh, present, not just the voice, but the presentation, his thought. He really had figured out who Trump was and he was speaking from that place when mm. he improvised. I always thought that was very, very, he was doing like the best and there's other people, you know, I yeah, don't yeah. cut anybody out, but uh, he, I thought his was, of, uh, it seemed like every, you know, comic, every late night host, everybody right. developed something at the time. Are, are there any of those, the ones, any of those ones that stuck out to you? Any of the late night hosts that were doing it before? I thought, <laughs> Trevor Noah's was actually good. Yeah. Was was pretty funny. He's pretty good. And yeah. I love the fact that Seth, My Seth Myers would do Trump and he would say, It's a horrible Trump. I just <laughs> yeah. love the fact he mitigated. Still has to yeah, do it he, though. You know, yeah. yeah. That was always very, very funny. Yeah. And then Jimmy um, Fallon got into it for a little yeah, bit. Yeah, Jimmy well, Fallon yeah. got into it for a little while. And he, you know, everybody was doing it. And one of the things I tried to do with my Trump from the beginning, and I try to do this with any impression, especially of a living person, is to Make it as nuanced as possible. Bring in as many elements as possible because, you know, we all speak and we all pull in different things. We pull in our mom. We pull in our dad. We pull in somebody we like. We pull in this. We pull in that. I had, you know, obviously a speech impediment. But when I, when Trump reannounced, I said, I need to like, I need to go back and I need to kind of relook at this impression. Mm. And I remember I did my notes and then I sat down and where is Trump from? Trump's from Queens. Who else is from Queens? And I'm thinking, who else is from Queens? Oh, well, of course, Christopher Walken 
who has the staccato when he speaks. Travis, wow, this place, you know. <laughs> and I thought, oh, wait, there's elements of that. In tr- you know, let me pull that in. Hmm. And then I grew up watching Groucho, uh, Groucho Marx, who yep. had a very sing-songy voice. Hello, I must be going. I came to say I cannot stay. I must be going. And if you listen to Trump, he's got a very, hello, everybody. Wow. Is this place incredible? Very, very amazing. And he does this weird thing where he counterbacks. He, he, um, he was talking about the wall one time. He goes, this wall is so tall. It's impenetrable. It's impenetrable. You cannot get over this wall unless you have a really tall ladder. And I just thought, like, he just did himself in, but he does it in such a great comedic way. Like, yeah, right. He does this weird kind of, you know, that whisper thing that he does. That he did at the CIA the day after the inaugural. I looked out. I looked out. Millions of people. Millions of people. They said, Trump doesn't draw. But I saw so many people. You know, that whisper. It's so, you know. So funny, and I, and because of all of that, I got to meet some great people. I got to meet like Daryl Hammond, and got to work with him a couple of times. And and then I did the Laugh Factory thing, which I won, which was great. And I did the thing on the well, the thing on the View was the first part of that, and then I went to the Laugh Factory. Okay, so it was years of you know years of working on something, um, a specific voice, but years of all the voice work uh, that all came together. And I think that happens with people when they have, when they're in their industry, whatever it is. Yeah. And there's like, they have like one passion thing, something they keep in their pocket that they're doing, but it's not that primary thing. And then whatever it is, it just comes together. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I always think of David Bowie, which seems strange, but they, I was a big David Bowie fan. And I remember like listening to his music as a kid, my sister loved him. And I was thinking like, wow, this is, this stuff is so complicated. It's, different he's he's dressed androgynously but his lyrics are this his lyrics are that and his he didn't really have other than space oddity he never had like a pop Mm. song and then i remember in night like here's him here's pop music and in 1983 he Mm. he it all comes together yeah that alignment oh my god i mean that quadruple platinum like the the like the music they, they knew he was there but he was changing. He's always changing and progressing and yeah. moving on. And it just was unbelievable. I mean, that album was huge. It's very interesting how that just, it's the culmination of right. all of the hard work, all that stuff. And then working with you, you know, you're uniquely qualified to do this one thing extremely right. well, right. like very, <laughs> hopefully like, something else. Like, after that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Just so much better than anybody else. That just, you, you, you get all the opportunity, yeah. you know, when, when it came your way. Part, like everything yeah. Came. And unexpected, like, uh, are you the highest paid or one of the highest paid people on all of Cameo? Is that right? Well, I, I read that somewhere. My, I, I was in uh, politics. Okay, I in the politics in category. Politics. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of really well known people donate it um, to charitable organizations, but I was, uh, man, there up to the insurrection. Yeah, I was doing extremely well. <laughs> <laughs> Funny how an insurrection Funny how can that kind of kills the <laughs> commercial market for happy birthdays and oh man, Jeremy have a tremendous bar mitzvah. You know. <laughs> uh, how many how many cameos do you think you've done? How many videos? I did, well, they count. They count. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I did sixteen hundred. Sixteen hundred cameos. Yeah, yeah. Wow! In over the stretch of a year, two oh, years, I, three years. I got on my my. Michelle was so you got to get on cam and a couple of friends too. Smart, got to get on cameo. Yeah, now. smart. Like, no one wants to see a Trump impersonator. He'll probably be on himself next week. Yeah, you know. And th- I got on. I was amazed. Mm. I was am- amazed. Yeah, I, it just was really. There were days when I was shooting five, six, seven, eight. From the time I got on cameo and between YouTube, which is totally you know totally different. I was doing long form comedy and yeah, doing yeah. interviews. I, I would get up, go to the gym, come home, and just get into Trump. Wow! Because something was always coming up, but the the cameos were coming in. Yeah, like shooting a lot on TikTok cameos. as well. Yeah, doing the, the TikTok blew up stuff. on TikTok. Blew yeah. up like to six million, and we had a meeting last. Well, that whole thing that I was talking to you about last night—that was all TikTok people we were get posting it together and shoot. Wow. With some other key 
big name TikTok, unfortunately, or I'm not going to say it is, but that person unfortunately got sick. Mm. Um, but it, it just, you know, it provides you all these great opportunities. Sure. Um, when you're, you know, I, I love what I do. I'm so lucky to do it. I do so many different things. The Trump thing has been such an amazing, you know, view. In. Yeah. It's the foot in the door yeah, the to door. so many opportunities for you. I, I cannot tell you how happy I was the first time I went to Warner brothers for the Conan O'Brien show. You're like, I can't believe it. Yeah. Warner brothers, you know? Yeah. I've been trying to get into that Conan. Yeah. yeah right. For, for years and years. And then you're there and it's incredible. And then we did the live shows. Um, uh, all the years at Comic Con in front of three thousand people, you know, I was, <laughs> and usually if I'm in front of three thousand people, it's 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 a corporate show and it's you know salespeople or something, but to have a real audience like, booing you, <laughs> boo, it was like I like it was like jet engine, you know, and then uh, in that moment I was like I was totally in character and I said, you hear that Conan? They're calling me their boo. <laughs> And I was like, I was like, like direct hit, direct yeah, hit, right. direct hit. Right. And he's so, I just have to say, I don't think he'll ever see this, but I hopefully he will. But that guy is so gracious and so generous. He treated me like an equal from the very first time I was on the phone with him. Hmm. Very first time. He seems that way. Yeah. He's one, he's one of my favorites in the business. He, he wants to elevate everyone he's on stage with. And yeah. I cannot thank him enough. We, he, they created a character. You know, I was Trump, but then we, for those shows, he created a character called Ca um, <laughs> Captain Make America Great Again, <laughs> which was an amalgamation of Trump and Captain America. So the, the wig is coming out under the leather skull cap, <laughs> and you can see my eyes, and I've got it on. But you know me, I'm not, I'm not the thinnest fella. <laughs> and, you know, so I've got this big gut and the red tie and the Captain America suit with slacks on. <laughs> it was just the funniest thing, you know. Uh, great he seems to have never lost touch with who, what, like the reason he got into the business, yeah. which is just to be funny. Yeah. No matter, let's try whatever we want to try because, because I think it's going to be funny, right. you know, and some of it falls flat and some of it crushes and he's and made I, an entire career out of it. And you made a great point. Some of it falls flat because it's the experimental element of what he did. I'm a big Ernie Kovacs fan and I always think that, that Conan to a certain extent is probably the closest to Ernie Kovacs and that let's try this. Let's try it. If it fails, it fails, but like, it, let's just do something different. Right. Right. You know, let's break this mold of what comedy is. Yeah, The artistic expression that allows you to continue creating something. Yeah. Yeah. And, that's and a, he's a smart guy, man. Oh, right. That guy right. He could have had a career in a completely different field and yeah. been just as successful, you know, in terms of, in terms of the height of that field. Right. You know, but he chose comedy, yeah, he chose <laughs> which is we which were, is cool. I remember we did a one of the sketches. I came out, did a bit, and, it, and they always run long. Like when I do Stern, everything's long in the original form. Mm -hmm. And he, they were like, "Okay, let's take a break." And he said, "No, we should do. We take let's move that line up here." And, he, and he's like editing in real time, not like I when I edit, I have to sit down, and mm -hmm. he's editing in real time, moving lines around. I was just like, wow, his mind yeah. just works. It's so tight. It's so comedic. He knows what works. He knows order. I mean, obviously, this is why he's success. But yeah, it's right. nice when you see it. Mm -hmm. You see the proof. You see the yeah. proof. It's not like this guy very, just got lucky. Right. It's, yeah. you, it's very rare. It's like when you meet a really uh, an executive from a major corporation or something, and you you get, oh, like, I see the price. see why you're, you are who you are. Yeah. Yeah. Like we're talking about money, the Chipotle yeah. CEO. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Super nice guy. Super smart. Yeah. You know. And like I said, like, oh, you're, you're just like us. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you're in human form. Yeah. $20 billion company? <laughs> you're, you seem like a regular dude. Yeah. Would never be able to tell. Right. Um, yeah, I like, uh, I, I, actually Conan's podcast is one of the podcasts I go back to quite a bit. If I, if I'm not trying, if I'm not like in learning mode, I just want to like, you know, have some entertainment and relax and stuff. Conan's is one of my favorites and he was interviewing, um, oh, he's had Dana Carvey on a bunch of times cause they, they always get along. Uh, but they they talk he's about the goat. Yeah, yeah so the goat. They, they talk about the impressions and I'm curious to hear kind of your thoughts on this. <clears throat> they talk about impressions and the way that Dana ta talks about impressions is he's always doing almost like an impression of the impression, like a right. caricature of the impression that's like more wild than what the person actually is. Right. Um, what, what, what do you feel about that? Is that what you try to do as well? No, Are you trying to I, go I, on I the nose? I actually have to be really careful. Okay. Because um, it is so, and I'll 
give you a bike perfect example. Like, you know, doing Austin Powers, baby. Yeah. You know, I, I have to be really careful that I'm not doing someone else's. Like, it becomes too mm. cartoon because it's a cartoon to begin with. Sure. With Trump specifically, since there's so many people doing Trump, every time I go on, I have a clip on my phone. It doesn't matter who, how many people I'm performing in front of 25 or 2,500. I listen to that clip. It's a specific clip that I have that covers everything about him Mm. because it's very easy um, in any job to just kind of go on autopilot. And it's like, no, 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 no. I have to go back to the source. I have to go back to the source. I have to go back to the source. I know what he is talking about because I do that with Dr. Phil. (laughs) I like, I like a bigger Dr. Phil than the real Dr. Phil. Yeah. You know, yeah. it doesn't matter how flat you make a pancake, it's got two sides. Okay. <laughs> okay. You can put a kimono on a squirrel, but it still won't speak Japanese. Okay. <laughs> you know, so him, I choose it for him. I am very judicious about who's the overblown one, with, but mm-hmm. that is his style. And yeah. people get, you know, not going to do it, not going to do it, wouldn't be prudent. <laughs> you know, and that goes back to the church lady. And, and then yeah. he has been in this so long and people, I mean, the guy is beloved. I mean, every comedian I know and impersonator impression, we, they love Dana Carvey because he himself is just plainly funny, mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. know, and then he has a certain take on his characters and that's, what's great. And also, um, Daryl Hammond, who I think is a really incredible and got screwed by SNL. Um, without the whole Alec Baldwin thing. Mm. He, if you watch his impressions and you, you remember Phil Hartman was doing, he was doing his, uh, you know, Bill Clinton. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. <laughs> what uh, Daryl came in, he amped up the sex and I was like, good choice. <laughs> That's a good choice. He made him a little more lecherous. Yeah, yeah. And, everything. and it was just, he, he did it. It didn't go bizarre, but it was just, but he had to differentiate himself from Phil Hartman. But he, I was just like, damn. And if you look, even his Trump, he differentiates it. He adds this other layer to it. He's, he's, I really feel he's an incredible, mm. uh, just an incredible, <clears throat> I, I hate the word impressionist for someone. Yeah. He's a great actor doing those characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I, uh, which I, you know, because sometimes I hate the word impressionist, but he really takes it, makes it his own. And I think that's what really good impressionists do. And Dana has made that choice. I'm taking this and I'm making it at my own. Yeah. Right. You know? Where he like, he just, he, he, he singles in on a specific aspect of right. their character and then decides to make that aspect, everything about them. Right. Like what you're saying with this guy that does Bill Clinton is just like, let's do the sexual, let's take that one piece, right. but make it, in him and every context. Right. And exactly. that's what almost makes yeah, it, it kind funny. of weaves, yeah. you know, we weaves it. And it is kind of like an acting thing. You choose that one thing in their personality and that's going to be throughout the entire performance, whatever scene. That's like your underlying mm. part of them. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating, dude. Um, I, I got a lot of other questions for you, but I don't want to spoil all of them because we do have the dinner party episode tonight. Right, right. Uh, I wanted to lay the foundation, build some context for who you are, the amazing journey that you've been through, uh, the decades of hard work that you've put into every aspect of your career, um, culminating to your 60th birthday party, yes. which you were kind enough to have me out for. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Um, I, you know, I'm a gregarious, I love life. I love people. I love interacting with people. And I, I, and I'm very, you know, I'm very blessed. I'm fully aware of where I came from and where I could be, but, but I'm here and, you know, I, I take accountability and responsibility for where I am mistakes and achievements. 